Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be live, even though we are live in Zoom from, for technical reasons, but such is life these days. At least we have the technology now. Um, it's, it's nice to be back here also after quite a few years now, I realize. Um, so I'll be a little longer, I think. So if people want to, to talk after, after this, uh, there's plenty of time. Uh, so today I want to give you a bit of a, an overview of kind of one of the main sides of our recent efforts in the group of Beate Fortsman at the University of Amsterdam, uh, where we, we've been looking a lot at the subcortex in many different, uh, different ways. And so we've developed uh, quite a, a complicated, well, an, an, an elaborate uh, process to to get to really um, imaging and modeling somewhat quantitatively uh, the, the subcortex anatomy in, in living humans. Um, so one thing that, that started a lot of the, the research we're having in the lab is uh, well exemplified in that quote from uh, I.D. Johnsonberg from uh, 2013 saying that uh, one curious features of many cognitive neuroscience studies is that they focus only on regions of the cerebral cortex, ignoring sub subcortical or cerebellar structures. This appears to be an accident rather than a deliberate strategy, which I think is the, the key here and then the interesting part. And indeed, even from the beginning of times, uh, from the Broadman uh, times up to the latest architectonic maps from Glasser and Van Essen, everything we see, everything we do is looking at, at cortical surfaces, as, as you can see in those uh, very nice maps from uh, Thomas Hero's work, the subcortex there is just a black void and the cerebellum is just completely cut off. So it's about the same. But if you, if you look a little bit closely at those structures, uh, you can see that even though we, we don't look at them, there's a lot of complexity. So if you look at anatomical definitions um, of the subcortex and just ask the simple question, how many structures are there in there? Well, if you look at what anatomists have been naming, we are around 455 structures. In terms of the cortex, uh, everybody's converging to a number that is close to 180 to 200 different areas. So the, the complexity of the subcortex is definitely not small compared to that of the, of the cortex. Uh, and you can appreciate some of that complexity, especially when you start uh, uh, using a lot of Teslas and, and increase the resolution of your, of your anatomical images and you can see nuclei and subnuclei that just kind of pull out there. Another thing that is quite striking is in uh, many diseases, there's uh, problems that are mostly starting in the subcortex, and then that, that can be also uh, alleviated by things like deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation doesn't target cortical areas. It can't, it, typically goes to the subthalamic nucleus or the globus pallidus and a few other regions really deep in the brain. Um, one piece of evidence that I've particularly like uh, because it, it was a bit random coming, coming to it, uh, it's a very nice paper from uh, people doing uh, Neanderthal genomics. Uh, so we all have Neanderthal genes by now, I think we've all been um, mixing in some ways, but those genes tend to be down-regulated. And in that paper, what they did is they looked at the, the, the kind of the, uh, a metric based on the arrays of Neanderthal genes and see how much they were down-regulated in different parts of the human body. And you can see, so a lot of different regions and everything that they are colored in uh, blue is brain areas and in yellow is uh, the testes. So it makes a nice story. It's quite clear. We don't want our brain to be too much like Neanderthals. Uh, 
But what I found really interesting is that you, when you start looking at all these different labels there, that the first one that pop up are codate, amygdala, cerebellum, spinal cord, putamen, nucleus accumbens, hippocampus. And then a little further away, you have cerebral cortex. So it seems that those regions tend to have some, some features that genetically we want to keep as human as possible and as different from at least our closest and common ancestor. If you look at brain evolution in uh, kind of a different scope, like the, in the work of Her uh, Susanna herculano Ausel, um, I was quite st stricken also to see how scaling also is not as obvious as we think. Uh, we imagine humans with their big cerebral cortices, uh, but when you count neurons, uh, which they did in, in those studies, they realize that the scaling is quite uh, stable between the ratio of cerebral to cerebellar cortices. And what happens with humans that makes us maybe special is that it seems we just have a lot more and a lot uh, more strong, stronger organization there. But we do, it's not just a, an imbalance between those different systems. So I hope with that, I, I give you a bit of uh, an idea that why we want to go beyond that surface view of, uh, of cortical to cortical region uh, information flow. One, because we know from classical um, neuroscience that a lot of the brain pathways are organized in loops that involve cortex and subcortical regions over and over again. Uh, the regions least like Neanderthal or that have most of the neurons or uh, targets for DBS are all the ones that are really tucked under. But maybe we'll, going back to the, the quote from A.D. Johnsonberg, so why are we uh, not looking at the subcortex? What is so difficult technically? Uh, so today I'm just going to talk about anatomical imaging. We've also been looking at uh, additional challenges of the uh, functional side, which uh, is still ongoing work. Um, so the first thing that is very obvious is those regions are very small. A lot of the nuclei start getting at the, a few millimeters in size. Uh, you have little beams. So the, I think the STN is about, about a coffee bean size, something like that. The second part that's also annoying is that they're tightly packed. So there's massive amounts of um, partial voluming in that, in that system. Uh, and, and you have to really be careful to find the boundaries between all the different regions, which is even worse because the different regions can be of various different appearances in different type of MRI contrast. Uh, so in T1 weighted images, for instance, you have a really hard time to find all the iron rich regions like the globus pallidus, uh, substantia nigra, red nucleus, or uh, subthalamic nucleus. And you need a iron sensitive, uh, more iron sensitive um, sequence to really be able to pick them out. Um, so we, we try to, to go a little bit into those directions. So we, we looked at what's the um, the current records that are openly available in terms of resolution is. Uh, so there's those beautiful maps from uh, Dan Galician's group from uh, 2016 already, which are two, uh, 350 microns um, quantitative maps of the entire brain on one individual, four session, 30 minutes each per contrast. So we're looking at about 12 hours of scanning per individual. Obviously, that's not something you can scale up. Um, so we went back to sh shrinking down a bit this approach, working with uh, Matan Khan and Vitske van der Zwaar at the Spinoza Center. And there they are, they built a very nice sequence that is very integrated. Uh, so combining uh, MP2H, um, and multi-echo uh, gradient type sequences. Uh, they can acquire T1, T2 star, and QSM uh, maps. 
from a very compact sequence that takes about 18 minutes at 700 microns. Uh, the nice thing is that there's very limited dead time, so the time where you wait for the MRI signal to recover for getting a new slice, and so you can be very efficient that way. So with that, we get uh, 10 different images, uh, both magnitude and phase, and then we combine them in different ways to um, recover the, the free type of MRI that we want. And the nice thing is we really use everything. We use both the phase and the magnitude. We use all the different echoes. So it's also very, uh, very nice that it, it really takes all the data in. Uh, one thing that always is a problem, even with shortened sequences, is motion. Uh, so we manage also to squeeze in a, um, a tiny uh, sequence of uh, fat navigators at every slice. Uh, so every time you take a, a slice of MRI, you take the nav navigator in 3D. Sorry, yes, in 3D that shows you the, the fat content of the head. Uh, and from that, you can define motion parameters, translation and rotation. And you can then adjust the grid of the uh, imaging in with a non-uniform Fourier transform. And then you can do a, a corrected reconstruction. And the nice thing is now you have, because it's, uh, it's retrospective in that sense, you have both the uncorrected and corrected uh, results. And so you can also compare. And that's, that's what we did with them. So we looked in particular at the, uh, the sharpness of boundaries, so in terms of anatomical definition. And uh, two things that were very interesting uh, on, in the res those results, uh, the first, uh, if we look in the, um, the bottom left corner uh, with the, uh, the amount of motion that you have and the corresponding um, blurriness of the boundaries is very much a, a linear relationship. Um, without correction, and then with correction, it, it really flattens. Uh, the other thing, if you look at the uh, more colorful uh, figure on top, that is quite interesting is that that relationship is also very different for different uh, types of boundaries. For instance, a gray matter, white matter boundary is actually fairly smooth and fairly blurred, uh, and that is independent of motion whereas some of the other boundaries, like boundary with the CSF, is much sharper. So we, we have all these nice, beautiful images, but they're still very noisy. Um, so one thing we really wanted to do is to see if we could denoise, but without removing all the, the high uh, quality of detail that we get in our high resolution images. And there was a very nice uh, work from um, uh, Mangeon and Coupé from uh, 2013 uh, in the world of uh, diffusion weighted imaging, where they used re redundancy across the different uh, acquisitions because you have you have a lot of different images with a different uh, uh, gradient orientation, and using that, doing a PCA decomposition and uh, separating image from noise by things that tend to be behave. Um, to have the variation that are systematic in the PCA to those that keep changing. The only problem there was that they use about 60 or more images typically in that system and they have the, the diffusion weighted magnitudes, whereas in our work we had only 10 images with magnitude and phase together, so we had to do a bit of uh, adaptation. First, doing some pre-processing of the phase to create images that had the same uh, noise structures. So creating the complex image with the um, real and imaginary part. And then creating a, a simplified way to estimate where to cut the uh, decomposition of the PCA so that we keep the signal, but not too much of the noise. Um, so this is a, an example of the decomposition where you can see on top the, so the singular values that change very slowly. They, they are different in different tissue types. 
Uh, but below, you can appreciate in the first eigenvector that there's a lot of structure. You can see a lot of anatomy in that first image. And as you move toward the fifth, it, it starts to dissolve into the noise and more or less strongly depending on the, the type of structure you're looking at. So that gives us some results where we, we remove a lot of the noise, but as you can appreciate in these uh, um, little cutout on the on the bottom, we can still see a lot of details. For instance, here all the vessels that we see very well in the uh, Air 2 star and, and QSM maps. And then when we quantified, we have a, a gain of 10 to 80 percent of uh, SNR, depending on the, the type of sequence we're looking at. So with all that, we uh, we put all that together and then uh, recruited a uh, pretty large data group, uh, set of patient of subjects, sorry, uh, from the age, from the lifespan, uh, adult lifespan, because 70 is still an adult um, uh, system. Um, and we try to get, uh, well, we, we got a lot of young people because they tend to be psychology students, so that helps. Uh, but um, we also try to get a even number of, of older groups so that we have balanced uh, numbers. And we got the uh, full brain uh, 07 millimeter resolution scans. We tried a slab that's centered on the subcortex for small, more details. And we also acquired diffusion on half of them. Um, and then from that, we were interested in looking at what are the effects of aging in the subcortex. So we know from previous studies uh, from our group, but also others, that there's uh, active, active malination and demalination across the adult lifespan. Uh, you have iron accumulation, which is particularly important for neurodegenerative diseases. You also have nuclei atrophy with cell death. And one thing that um, was really uh, started with um, Max Koiken's uh, 2013 paper was to realize that you also have systematic local shifts that as the brain um, shrinks with age, then some of the nuclei will move differently. And so the, the location, for instance, of the STN that you would want to have very precise for deep brain stimulation will change based on that as well. Uh, so all these, these results that we already have are, are quite nice. And some of them, like the, the study of uh, Fjell and colleague, use a lot, lot of people. But they're usually fairly limited in, in terms of the number of structures. Uh, so typically, we look at the striatum, thalamus, the amygdala, and the globus pallidus, mostly because they're available in the classical softwares like FreeSurfer or FSL. Sometimes we can also look at STN, SN, RN, that's about it. Uh, so we, we went into a, a, an adventure to try to, to get as many structures as possible. Um, so we, we tried to, to make a fairly long list of targets. We ended up uh, being able to do at least 17 structures uh, with left, right, separate, so about 30 different labels. Uh, for which we had uh, manual expert delineations by multiple experts so we can understand the viability across people as well. And we could use them then to create priors. So we can look at priors of spatial location, priors of um, skeletons, which is more the location of the inside of the structures, and also the contrast that we see in MRI. And then we fed that into a Bayesian um, uh, framework that builds posteriors first at the <coughs> voxel level based on the uh, location and intensities in the subject data. Uh, then some uh, smoothing using a Markov random field approach and then some, um, post uh, some uh, posterior measurements of um, volumes to regularize places whether the signal is really poor. So with that, we, uh, we did a lot of um, validation with uh, manual, um, manual delineations. 
and we could see that the, the results are fairly fairly similar in terms of overlap uh, and, and distances. Um, so the next step, now that we have a lot of those different structures, we wanted to be able to, to get to myelin and iron content. So, so far, a lot of people have been looking at, let's say, QSM or R2 star, R1 or T1 or T2 weighted images. Say, well, this represents myelin, this represents iron. But we know from the physics that it's not quite correct and physicists are quite um, active in trying to, to find that, that recipe and, and refine it as much as possible. So when I was in um, at the Max Planck Institute with Bob Turner, uh, one of the students did a very interesting work uh, looking at uh, advanced microscopy systems to quantify iron and uh, proxy for myelin and then feed that to the um, post-mortem um, signals that they got from the same sample. And they could really sh uh, show nicely that you get a, a linear relationship between those, those parameters. Then uh, Ricardo Metere, who was uh, also at the Max Planck a few years later, uh, went into a deep dive into uh, old um, literature in microscopy of um, chemical uh, measurements on biological tissues where people could measure the quantity of myelin and iron in, in various parts of the brain that they, they measured in multiple individuals. Um, but those, those measurements are from the, the 30s and the 50s, so it's, uh, it's quite impressive. And so from these measurements, you get some, some normative values that would be the, the in vivo amounts of myelin and, and iron that you would want, and then you can compare it to what you measure with your imaging. Uh, but unfortunately with this, especially for the myelin, the number of different structures that they, they had sampled were fairly low. So we added a third component, which is a, another project where we're looking at um, whole brain microscopy of, um, of uh, post-mortem subjects. And we had uh, myelin sensitive stains uh, based on uh, silver. And we could use those to give relative numbers between structures that had been measured and structures that we wanted also to get an impression for. So we put all of that into a big uh, model and then we added a uh, model comparison technique using either IEC or uh, PIC to try to find the, the the win winning um, representation. And so the, the most parsimonious models are for iron, a, a linear combination of R2 star and QSM, and for myelin of R1 and R2 star. And when we fit those models to our data and then um, measure the corresponding um, iron and myelin quantities in our data set, we can see that it matches quite well what the literature and the stain measurements have been giving us as well. And if you want to have a look, so it, it gives you images that are fairly similar to the original ones, but you can appreciate, for instance, on the myelin one, how the, uh, the globus pallidus, for instance, really comes into view as a as a gray matter structure, which is which is what it is, uh, because now the iron has been uh, kind of separated out in that in that map. Last but not least, uh, we were um, a little frustrated with measurements of volumes, especially with small structures. A few voxels difference in the segmentation makes a big difference in volume. So those measurements were very sensitive to noise and uh, not really robust. And we were thinking that, well, cortical thickness is a very nice example of, of doing it differently where you have a local measurement and then it's a lot more stable. Uh, so we tried to develop a, an approach based on the classical medial shape theory, 
which was to create a, a distance function that starts from the boundary, then build the skeleton that will tell you what, what is the place that is most inside the structure, and then simply measure the distance between the two. And then from that, we have basically some sort of generalization of cortical thickness on any kind of shapes. And then we have local measurements. So you can see on the, on the left, the example of the skeleton and thickness measurements on ventricles on the subject. And on the right, some um, uh, articles from uh, Boris Gutman and colleagues where they use a very uh, similar definition on uh, the ADNI data set to show some, some of the aging effects. So now that we've put all of that technology together, it's time to start finally looking at some results. Um, so first, myelination and demyelination. We were, um, so we were uh, looking at a lot of different structures. Um, here's a visualization, as a, it's a bit complicated. So we have for each structure, uh, we have the, uh, a, a, an exemplar of a young or older subject to have a, an idea of the um, shape changes. And below we measure the median values of um, myelin and the interquartal range, which would be the, uh, the equivalent of the standard deviation. So to measure the variability of the uh, measurements within the, a single subject. Um, so what you can see is that there's structures that are very stable, for instance, the amygdala or the clostrum. Others, so the white matter structure like the phonix and the internal capsule here tend to have decrease in myelin, uh, but also uh, the STN, the red nucleus, the striatum and the thalamus as well, or the, the VTA. Um, some also, like the globus pallidus, have an increase in heterogeneity. So not only the myelin goes down, but it's, it becomes more variable uh, across the structures. And it tends to be a bit more pronounced for white matter versus gray matter. For iron accumulation, uh, here the, the pictures are a bit different because some structures uh, have already very strong iron baseline, so they are much darker in this representation. Uh, and you can also appreciate that those have also more dynamics uh, with regard to iron accumulation. So globus pallidus externa, right nucleus, substantia nigra, STN, striatum, all have uh, accumulate uh, VTA also have all um, iron accumulation, whereas uh, most of the other structures tend to be fairly stable. Uh, one thing that also is fairly clear is whenever the, the iron does accumulate, you also have an increase in the viability as well. Now looking at, uh, at shape, so we looked at the thickness, but we also looked at volume because it's, it's worth also measuring. Uh, what you would expect uh, <coughs> from the ventricles, which are on top, is happening that the lateral ventricles tend to expand, third ventricle as well. And then some of the other structures tend to uh, decrease in size. For instance, the amygdala, which was fairly stable in terms of the composition, tends to decrease quite strongly in size. Um, the striatum also, thalamus as well, uh, globus pallidus past um, externa. And some structures also tend to be fairly stable um, as well. For instance, the PPN or the PAG. And finally, there was the last step was to, to look at those local shifts. And we were, we were essentially looking for uh, kind of a, an expansion of the lateral ventricles, which means that you would expect that there is a brain structure would have to kind of push out towards the, the side of the, of the skull. Uh, but in fact, that's not the most prominent uh, motion it's more that things tend to sink down 
um, in the skull. So there, there is a little bit of movement outward, but there is a more strongest movement that is uh, more systematic for a lot of the structures is to a uh, downward trend um, in the uh, axial um, domain um, axis, sorry. Um, so of course, that's a lot of different things happening in a lot of different ways. So we try to, to uh, see there's shared patterns between all those different structures. Uh, and sometimes there are, uh, for instance, the red nucleus and the striatum, which are also some of the structures that vary the most, tend to vary also in the same way. Um, but you can see that there's also some structures that are very different, like the amygdala that is um, changing mostly in shape, but not so much in terms of the, um, the sorry, the, um, uh, uh, sorry, quantitative MRI contents. Uh, you also have things like the PPN or the PAG that are just fairly stable overall. Um, so you, have, you do have a few patterns, uh, there's a VTA, thalamus, phonics, and also to have that kind of um, iron accumulation, increase in viability, uh, and then, then everything is kind of stable and a little bit of decrease in size. Um, others uh, can be very different, like the claustrum that has not really any relationship with the rest. So in order to help us and others also to, uh, to make sense of these very complex results, uh, we built a little app uh, which has a 3D viewer on top where you can really rotate all the different structures, look at one structure um, specifically. And then for each of them, you can also look at the age. So we have a, an age slider that allows us to see how they, they change and how they move. And then below, you can inspect all the different uh, different curves for the different um, different measurements that we had. And all of that data can also be downloaded and reanalyzed differently. So in conclusion, um, I'll try to keep things simple. I would argue that subcortical structures are important uh, in many different ways, that uh, multimodal ultra field MRI um, is definitely the key, the key to studying them in vivo. I think by now, seven Tesla is really are getting mature in that, that domain, that we can really start making studies with large number of subjects. Um, and that the patterns that we observe are definitely multifaceted, uh, that you don't have just the iron accumulation, you don't have just the demyelination, there's, there's a lot of interplay, and there's a lot of um, viability in those structures that we just tend to bring into one big lump uh, for commodity. Um, so before I end, um, I would like to uh, mention all the people who've been involved. So this is uh, mostly the picture of the lab. Um, so this has been really uh, the um, a big project for Peter uh, Forsman, who's been uh, making this happen, uh, recruiting everybody, getting the funding and all the uh, the ability to get the MRI. Uh, Matan Khan from the AMC in um, Amsterdam has been very, very instrumental in really getting these images uh, working and the, the sequences uh, tested and validated. Uh, Anna Kualkamada, our, our expert anatomist has been leading the, the team of people who've been able to uh, carefully delineate a lot of structures both for informing the models and but also validation. Max Koiken, who uh, unfortunately left us now, uh, has been uh, very, um, very instrumental at, at really making a lot of those early studies where we started looking at the different things. And uh, finally, Stephen Militic has been uh, really building this, uh, all this very complex system into a very clean model with the, with the app and all the statistics that he, he developed for it. Um, last slide, I promise, uh, I wanna 
leave with a message that is very close to our heart in the lab and my heart in particular is that uh, we really believe that open science is the only way forward. And so we try to put everything online. So our database of 100 subjects is uh, freely available. We put a, tra a subcortical trajectory viewer on the web as well. And all the toolboxes and software that we developed for this project are integrated in the Nairis toolbox that I've been creating over, over the years. With that, thank you for your attention and I'm ready for some questions.